process, I was going to stand up and start talking. And uh, I think I'm just going to sit here and talk with you. And this is kind of like the little living room. I'm really excited to talk about social justice with people who actually want to listen. I mean, th I think TED Talk brings out a certain demographic, we must admit, that understands and, you know, we have inquiring minds and, you know, we're curious about things and we want to feel intellectually stimulated. We feel good when someone says something that we might be familiar with. You know, if I started saying Wanda Upper with a Sira Sutta, the Druta marches perish to the Ruta, by the Revine and switch the cure of which virtue and gender is to fleur, I'm sure many of you would recognize the whole Canterbury Tales. Does that make us smarter? I'm not really sure. I guess maybe, I don't know. I started working on social justice issues many years ago. I started working on prison issues because uh, I heard about all these innocent people that were being locked up and occasionally they would be let out. And so I did benefits for the Innocence Project because I wanted those people to be let out of prison. And then I went to a prison issues residency in 2009 and I learned that there were many more issues about the prison system that I needed to learn about. Like the disparity in prosecution, how the war on drugs and the war on poor people and three strikes and the privatization of prison has driven up the po prison population. And I actually created an animated video of this and we're gonna start playing it right now. It's called proliferation. I, I got tired of saying, hey, we have over 2.3 million people in prison, actually 2.4 of you in food ice. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. One in every 99 people in the U.S. is in prison. When you start spitting out statistics like that, people blaze over. You know, it's kind of, like, kind of like talking about Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff embezzled and manipulated more than $65 billion. If you don't know what a billion is, it just kind of glazes over. So I usually say 65,000 million. People can understand that a little better. Now imagine. These green dots up here are prisons that were built before 1900. I posted this on YouTube and someone said, it's impossible, there's no way we could still be using prisons that were made before 1900. But we have San Quentin built in 1952. We have Sing Sing built in 1828. We have Clinton Corrections built in 1845. All three of those prisons are still in use. No renovation, maybe a little renovation every now and then. I don't know what you know what's happening this week. This week, this organization or a company called Corrections Corporations of America, a publicly traded company, the CXW, they're propositioning, they sent a letter out to 48 states. They want to privatize the prisons in this state and other states. See, the odd thing is, in the 1980s, the prison population was in decline. Crime rate was in decline. But what happened was, we had the privatization of prisons. We had stockholders that had interest in those prisons filling up. So if you don't call your congressman or senator or governor, we're going to have full prisons again, despite what the crime rate is. You know, I got a grant from Creative Capital, I'm going to try to get rid of this. I got a grant from Creative Capital recently that it gave me funds to talk about the parallels between the U.S. prison system and modern day slavery. Oh, I switched that around. I guess the prison system and slavery. I get them confused sometimes because they're so similar. You know one of the biggest workforces in Georgia, if you take the four prisons in Georgia, it's the biggest workforce in Georgia. We have companies, our local companies as well, we have hundreds of companies that use prison labor. Boeing, Microsoft, even Mary Kay Cosmetics, AT&T, Caterpillar. A lot of call centers are used prison labor. Uh, one prison in Colorado right now is using prison labor for harvesting crops. They're paying them 60 cents a day. And you thought the Chinese were getting screwed. 
Did I say screwed in TEDx? Is that, is that yes. appropriate? Yeah, screwed. So, I realized recently that talking about prisons, I get a lot of different results from people. You know, people say, that's horrible that this money's being used this way. And I realized that it's not really about prisons. And could you turn the music down for a second? Because I want to go to another subject. I actually wore this today for a reason. It's Trayvon Martin. And we think that, uh, I've been following murders by police and others for years now. And this Trayvon Martin situation is not so unusual. If you remember in 1999, Amadou Diallo was shot 41 times by New York City police a special division, which was later disbanded. Those officers were tried later and were acquitted in a trial in Albany. We have Sean Bell. Oh, I forgot to say, those officers that were involved in that shooting, they were acquitted. Sean Bell, on the eve of his wedding night, was shot 50 times. His friends were critically injured, he was killed. By the way, these are unarmed folks, shot by the cops. And uh, those cops were just fired a few weeks ago, five and a half years later. We have uh, Oscar Grant in San Francisco on the dark. We have all these cases, but what makes Trayvon Martin case so significant, it happened in a 911 call, and we have social media, and now there's more outrage. And it's not about the hoodie. I think um, Bruce Springsteen wrote this song called American Skin, which is really amazing. It's about skin, you know? It's about, I mean, I could, you know, it does, it's not about skills, and it's not about Arizona iced tea, it's about the skin. And I want to share a couple of stories. It's not about racism, it's not about prejudice, it's not about bigotry. It's about assumption. We all assume things. We all assume things. It's a nice word. I remember in uh, elementary school, we had this kid, this Asian kid who came to school, and I'm in South Carolina, and I remember all the other kids was, were excited about this Asian kid coming to school, and when we met him, we did stuff like this. <sighs> because we know all Asians know karate, right? And at the time, I didn't know how racist that was, or I'm sorry, assuming that was. No one messed with him because they thought he might fly through the air and like keep him. <laughs> so, we have assumptions. I did it, and other people do it. And last year, I was in San Francisco waiting in a lobby. And I had my cello next to me. And um, I was waiting for my ride to the airport. And there was some other students in the lobby. And this uh, young white male comes in, really excited to see the cello. He goes across the room and asks this young Asian guy, is that your cello over there? <laughs> and I realized, He's not really being racist, he's making assumptions. How many people here know a black cellist? Raise your hand, besides me. <laughs> okay, that's, that's actually pretty good. A black professional cellist, raise your hand. Okay, one, one, that's, is that it? Two, okay, that's good, that's good. Personally, not, not, not online and stuff, okay, good. Well, I think it's, it's not as common, so if you're a betting person, but we have assumptions. This time is really flown by, and I really want to play some music for you. But I want everyone to challenge their assumptions, all their assumptions. It doesn't make us bad people. We have a history we need to talk about. We have a lot of bad things in our history. And the only thing we're going to do it, the only way we're going to do it is have dialogue with each other about our bad history. In Tacoma here, we had this thing in 1902 where the city ran out the Chinese and burned down Chinatown. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that. But we have a lot of things that have happened. I want to play a piece for Trayvon, and then I want to play a piece called Strange Fruit. It's about the trees that are in South Carolina, from where I'm from, that, where people used to hang from, where people used to lynch, and then there's still people today that have charred body parts as souvenirs, and they keep them with pride. This is for Trayvon.